In the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Tonight is class 27 of our Orthodox Survival Course. In our last class, we did uh, an overview or a, a retrospective summary of where we've been so far. And uh, going summarizing briefly the, the development, or rather the descent, or the degeneration of Western thought from the High Middle Ages right up to the 19th century. And then with the later 19th century and the Revolutionary Era, we have the terminus ad quim, the end of the line, the last bus stop uh, on this bad journey, which is nihilism. Because that's where it, it was all leading. It inevitably had to come to this point. So tonight we're going to begin several sessions on nihilism. We're going to have several because I'd like to take our time and go through Father Seraphim Rose's book on nihilism. Which, uh, in printed form, it's a 128-page book. It was actually just one chapter of a proposed book he had wanted to write when he was young that never was never written. So there's an outline of his proposed book at the end of the printed nihilism book from St. Herman Press. Now at the end of this long journey together that we summarized in our last class, in class 26, we have arrived at the dead end of the Western philosophical and spiritual project, the philosophy of nihilism. Nihilism as a body of thought, and more importantly as a demonic spiritual power, is the inner content of this ongoing revolution of the current age that we've been talking about. And therefore, we need to understand it as best we can, not only intellectually, but spiritually. Above all, it's a, it's a spiritual phenomenon, right? And we can only combat it spiritually, but we need to understand it both intellectually and spiritually. And we need practically to be able to recognize its manifestations, its thought patterns, key words, social implications, political programs, so that when you see it, you see it on the internet, you see it on TV, you hear it in the classroom, say, aha, nihilism. You get the clues, you learn the clues. Right? And you say, ha, that's nihilism. To recognize these manifestations whenever we see them so that we can relate what is going on around us to this overall pattern of understanding. In other words, these are not isolated phenomena. They're all connected. So that we can work from a unified, coherent understanding of our situation. Now, I do not have to reinvent the wheel in order to guide us through this subject. Since Father Seraphim Rose, in 1962, when he was so layman, wrote a 128-page monograph on the subject, Nihilism, the Root of the Revolution of the Modern Age. And this will form an excellent guide to our study. Um, of course, this is, as we know, this is just part of a much larger book he intended to write that never got written. But this part was completed, and it has been published. For $9, you can buy this from St. Herman Press. There's a, the book's in a second edition now that contains an additional essay on the philosophy of the absurd. And the text of the first edition is online at this URL that I've reproduced here. What I propose to do is let Father Seraphim guide us through this subject step by step, and therefore I shall summarize what he wrote in the order that he wrote it. Okay. The content of his essay are as follows. One, introduction, the question of truth. It all gets back to the question of truth. What is truth? And then the, the existence and the absoluteness and the knowability of truth. And then part two is the stages of the nihilistic dialectic, where it's the, the nihilism that we see in, the, in violent revolution, whether it's physical revolution or cultural revolution, that, that nihilism of destruction is actually simply the last stage and the, there had to be other stages leading up to it that he characterizes as liberalism, realism, vitalism, and then finally the active nihilism of destruction. We're going to go back and, uh, and, and walk through that with him. Sometimes liberals, genuine liberals, people who say, oh, I, uh, I honor all opinions, I tolerate various you know, um, points of view, I'm a tolerant person, they seem like nice people, right? But that school of thought paved the way for Nihilism. Accepting. Accepting everything, right? That paved the way for nihilism. Pardon me? Yeah, they're intolerant of, of, of truth. Uh, the only sin is to be, in, the only sin is to insist there's an absolute truth. But in the 19th century, liberalism seemed like a nice thing, right? We're going to have um, more open borders and free markets and exchange of ideas, and we're going to have people of different faiths living side by side and being nice to each other and and we're going to be free of old authoritarian constraints and so forth. It seemed like a new, uh, a happy new period was dawning where people were more free, right? And, um, and then when nihilism came, when a violent revolution comes, people say, oh, no, I wasn't expecting that. See, we want to go back to being nice, but they don't realize that they had taken away all the barriers to the violent revolution. Their heads chopped. And then they're the ones who get their heads chopped off. There's a caricature of a liberal in uh, Possessed in the Demons by Dostoevsky, you know, where there's this town that the, <clears throat> the revolutionaries, the nihilists, are taking over this town. And there's this older figure who's kind of a pitiful figure 
who's the old from the older generation of liberals. And of course, it was the liberals later on in Russia. It was the liberals in the Duma, and then the liberals uh, in the February Revolution that paved the way for Bolshevism. So we're going to go go through the those stages of so liberalism, realism, vitalism, and nihilism. Then there's a section on, on the theology and spirit of nihilism. It has a theology. Ultimately, all serious any kind of serious school of thought has a theology. It addresses a, and because the question of who God is or God's existence is the ultimate question. Right? So the theology of nihilism is the rebellion, the war against God, and the worship of nothingness. That's what nihilism is from the Latin nihil, which means nothing. Then the nihilist program. What are nihilists after? What's their goal? Destruction of the old order, making of a new earth, and fashioning of the new man. And we're there right now. Right? We're, on, we're on the cusp of this new man with uh, the transhumanist movement. Right. So we're, we're arriving at at uh, achievements of nihilism that the revolutionaries 150 years ago couldn't have dreamed of, or maybe they dreamed of them as simply as dreams, but now we're there with the denial of the difference between the sexes, the denial of difference between the human species and other species, and uh, then the attempt to ma make people into something uh, immortal, quote-unquote, Cyborg. cyborgs, uh, uh, transhumanism. It's called transhumanism. Then the final section is called Beyond Nihilism. We're going to take our time and go through the book carefully in order to gain the full benefit of Father Seraphim's insights. I'm not sure how long each section is going to take. Remember, we're, we're inventing this class now as we're going along. So I'm not sure how long this is going to take. I do not think we shall need to spend five whole classes, one for each section on the book, but I'm not sure. We're going to see. Let's take it one class at a time and see how far we can go each week. This week, I do intend to spend the entire class on part one, the question of truth. This is the foundational question. And the examination of this question lays a, a good foundation for our understanding the rest of the book. The question of truth lays this answer to this question. The question of truth lays the foundation for understanding the entire subject of this nihilism. So it bears careful study. As we go along, some of us will be using the printed text. Others are going to be using the online text. I shall be quoting from the book at length sometimes. And when I read a quote, I shall try to refer both to the page number for those using the book and section paragraph number for those using the online text. But I have to apologize. Tonight... <laughs> I use strictly the online text because I couldn't find my book. So I, in this set of the in this edition of the notes, I just have uh, paragraph numbers. But um, later on, I hope to find the book and I'll insert. I'll, I'm going to edit these notes and put in page numbers as well for those who ha actually have the physical book. So section one of the book is the introduction, the question of truth, and uh, these A, B, these uh, these little subtitles under A, B, and C for the my subtitles. There's, there are no subtitles in the actual book. There's just introduction, question of truth. These are my subtitles as I go through and summarize the, 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 paragra the successive paragraphs of the book. So paragraph one, what is nihilism? Father Seraphim points out that we can make a mistake of focusing on the manifestations of nihilism and never get to the essence of it. So Father Seraphim begins his essay by posing the problem of defining nihilism and pointing out that we can get caught up in the outward results of it you get caught up in the phenomena, in the, the different manifestations of it, the destructiveness of political and cultural revolution, uh, the drug culture, the darkness and filth of modern art, or rock music, and so forth. We can just get caught up in the phenomena and just spend all of our energy being upset about that or trying to understand that and not get at the essence what's connecting all of these things. There's one fundamental idea or set of ideas connecting all of these things. The trees and the forest. Yes, not, not seeing the forest for the trees. And uh, modern people are very prone to do that because, remember when we were studying Richard Weaver, he talked about modern man being obsessed with details and specialization. There's a chapter called Fragmentation and Obsession, right, where everybody's obsessed with details and they don't see the, they don't see the big picture. We should, do that. we should do that book again, yes. He proposes, so Father Stern proposes to go beneath the surface and study the nature of the entire movement to get at the essence of the problem. Uh, paragraphs two to four deal with two pitfalls, apology and he calls, that he calls apology and diatribe. There are some people who want to apologize for the nihilists. Well, they're just poor victims. You don't understand them. You know, they're, they're making a valuable contribution. You know, and there's diatribe, you know, you know, just being angry and just screaming about all the, the barbarity and the grotesqueness and the evil and, and just railing against the whole thing. We can fall into the two of uh, the opposing mistakes of two extremes, to apologize for the nihilists or simply to rail against them, right? To, to just be upset and yell about it and not, not accomplish anything. So neither is helpful. One, the mistake of the apologists is that in attempting to understand nihilism, they begin to feel sorry for the nihilists. 
as being victims. Well, they're just victims, you see. I know they're smashing windows and they're, and they're beating up uh, people and they're um, destroying little children and so forth, but they're, they're victims. Or even seeing something positive in them. We don't understand this is a positive protest. This, is a, this, is a, this has vital uh, energizing qualities that, that help society, you know. Um, as, so, so they apologize for them as if they had something good to offer. In fact, they have nothing good to offer. It's nothing good about it. One thinks, for example, the character of Raskolnikov in Crime and Punishment. It's easy for people to read the book superficially without understanding Dostoevsky's message. To take a kind of romantic or effeminate pitying approach to dealing with the character. Oh, poor Raskolnikov. You know, he's this poor student and he just has a fevered brain and he doesn't know what he's doing. And, or he's rebelling against the bourgeois morality and so forth and so on. Instead of seeing him clearly as what he is. He's an amoral murderer. He's invented a, or accepted a terrible demonic idea and he, and he murders people. Okay. Of course, at the end of the book, he converts under the, the influence of Sonia. Uh, but for most of the book, he's an amoral murderer, right? A violator of God's law. He has a theory. Of yeah, he invented a whole theory about the Superman. Basically, it's, it's a Nietzschean Superman that, that the superior, the, the, the transhuman being, the new man, right, is, is above the moral law. So he can, he's going to take the, the life of this uh, pawnbroker because she's just this insect that doesn't contribute to society, right? So it, it's his. He can take the law. He can, he's obeying a higher law or he creates the law because he's, he's proving that he's uh, uh, the, new, the new man the, who's, can, who's above God's law. There are others who rightly, rightly have no sympathy for the nihilists, but they can waste all their time just railing against them for their barbarity or destructiveness, not get the essence of the problem. You know, just, oh, those young people, or, 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 or uh, rock music, or just those, that racial group, or whatever, and, and just, you spin your wheels, you know, wasting your energy on this, okay? In our railings, we can forget, also, there's another problem with railing. We can forget we are permeated with the spirit of nihilism. That's hard, that's hard to accept, because we're, well, we're Christians, we're um, people who, who love the old culture and so forth, we love God's law, we love order, we love civilization. But because we just were products of this society to a greater or lesser extent, whether we grew up in the so-called communist East or so-called capitalist West, we we're products of the system. And so some of the, the, the infection of nihilism is in us too. And if we spend too much time railing at the people who are openly nihilist, we can not see the, what the beam that's in our own eye, right, as our Lord says. So we have to focus, on, we have to study the question more dispassionately. Simply, so simply indulging in diatribe is self-defeating intellectually because it focuses, again, on manifestations, phenomena, fragments of the problem, right, rather than the essence of the problem. And it's also self-defeating spiritually because we cannot defeat this evil until we recognize it in ourselves. Right? Recognize it in ourselves. So, so part, of the, part of our whole purpose of our entire class has been to help us recognize when we see pathologies, spiritual, intellectual, or cultural, to... to, to take stock of ourselves, see how does this affect our, our, our own upbringing, how does this affect our own education, how does this affect our responses to things, and so forth. Okay. What I call section C is paragraphs 5 to 11 of this part of the book, where he talks about the essence of nihilism. And the essence is there is no truth. But those in, that's directly from Nietzsche. Except their own. Their own truth, right. It's an, we're going to get to that later on. They have an anti-metaphysic. That's their own truth, right. It's, it's actually... Okay, it's because that's so, truth it's facetious, or it's Nietzsche is being um, I don't know, facetious. He's being paradoxical. He's hiding something behind what he's saying. So, so Father Seraphim's project here, in, in this actually, he was then he was still at Eugene. Um, his project may seem too ambitious, he says. He admits, but actually, the question of the essence of nihilism, he says, is quite simple. It has been defined by its most famous famous proponent, Nietzsche. It's considered the father of nihilism. This is a quote from Nietzsche. There is no truth, that there is no truth, that there is no absolute state of affairs, no thing in itself. This alone is nihilism of the most extreme kind. It's demonic. It's demonic, of course. It's a demonic denial of, of God, right, of being, of goodness. Okay? So that's it. <laughs> it would be interesting. Behind Nietzsche. Right? Well, all of this, yeah. Well, there, there are people, we've, we've discussed some of that. Because they just don't pop up. So. No, no. Well, well, as we pointed out, the whole, all, all the things we've been studying have been leading up to this. Right. Um, our entire examination of Western, the descent of Western thought into greater and greater meaninglessness would predict exactly this outcome. 
right? It's the end of the line. This is where they've been leading the whole thing to this point, right? And so it is. It's the end of the line. So the task of understanding nihilism gets back to the basic question, what is truth? Is there an absolute truth? Okay. And yes, there, there are people behind it, but there are lots of people that they influence who believe in it, right? And they, they invent all these philosophical theories to deny truth, right? To deny God. So the, really the, the meat of this section, this introduction is in paragraphs 12 to 20, where we talk about absolute truth and the relativ and so-called relativity of truth, and then section E, the four schools of negative, what Father Seraphim calls negative metaphysics. So Father Seraphim says it's it. He, I'm summarizing now what he what he writes here in paragraphs 12 to 20. It is common today to say that those who believe in the existence and nobility of absolute truth are out of date. They're naive. That's antiquated. Right? All truth is relative. The usual translation of Nietzsche is there is no truth, no absolute state of affairs. All truth is relative is the credo of the man in the street today. They think they're so wise. You know, no you tell you tell someone, oh, I'm Orthodox. Well, you know, I think all religions are the same, and they think they're so wise that they, it's so original <laughs> when they say that they're just parroting what they've been hearing all their lives, right? There's no such thing as truth. All truth is relative, so forth and so. But they, they people are just convinced this is the, the the epitome of wisdom. Yeah, because it's also easy. It's easy, yeah. It's easy, and it's it's uh, it lets you off the hook too. You don't have it. It makes no moral requirements. Now, people believe they're very wise for believing this. They're the good guys, right? They're, they're on the winning side of history. And anyone who believes in an absolute truth must be a fanatic, a bigot, extremist, zealot, jihad, whatever. Okay. Science, the common man says, is the final arbiter of truth. And since scientific theories are always changing, truth is changing, right? Science tells us this, science tells us that. You can always, that's, uh, you get, don't you get tired of hearing that? I mean, you hear this in, you know, a study, studies have shown science tells us this, science tells us that. So far. So far, yeah, the tomorrow's going to tell us the opposite, right? Um, that, that reminds me of a, a from the um, the life of uh, Huey Long, this uh, the, this famous Louisiana uh, demagogue Huey Long, who was assassinated in 1935. Yeah, he was. Yeah, that, that's another story. But yeah, he was always quite a he's always quite a good talker. And in his early days, um, as a young man, he sold uh, he he was he was he sold um, a cooking product to housewives. But he was trained by a man who told him a story about um, high papalorum and low papahirum, and uh, and it was actually a it was it was a it was a product for um, black people to straighten their hair with, and they would go to the, <laughs> they'd go to these rural towns in Louisiana and sell a hair straightener to the black people, and um, and uh, and it, but if 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 they wanted to straighten their hair, it was high papalorum, but if they wanted to take it as a medicine to cure their sicknesses, it was low papahirum. So you can. <laughs> so science is like that, right? Tomorrow, tomorrow it's high papalorum. Tomorrow, it's, to, today it's high papalorum. Tomorrow it's low papahirum. They just tell you the opposite, you know, or that it's something completely different. And you, the next day, and you're supposed to believe it. So um, today is the high papalorum study that comes out, and low tomorrow is the low papahirum study that comes out. And they say completely different things, but it's 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 still the same thing, right? It's still truth, right? Even though it's completely different. Science tells us this. Science tells us that. This truly naive faith, which can be called scientism, is the real opium of the people of today. Okay, scientism. Scientism, among the educated classes, or the, the learned ones, scientism really reached its zenith in the, in the 19th century. In the 19th century is when the educated people believed in scientism. In the 20th century, the masses believe in scientism. The actual scientists should know better by now, right? I mean, cutting-edge scientists know that all this naive belief in science is, is misplaced. Yeah, but, but they go on playing on it. They go on. Lose the stipend. Yeah, but they'll lose their they'll they'll lose their um, their cush jobs and their grants and everything. They will knowingly publish things they just know aren't true, um, and go on deceiving the masses, right? With this scientism. Okay, the unreflective scientific specialist, as Father Seraphim calls him, the average scientist agrees with this faith. Okay, the Joe scientist in the street, the low the lower ranks, right? And the and the people agree with this faith. He is fundamentally not interested in ultimate questions. This is a, you know, I'm sure any of us who work in uh, academia, work in engineering. engineering, work in medicine, work in whatever, many, any fields related to modern science, we realize that most of our colleagues are pragmatists. They only care about getting results. They're not interested in ultimate questions. And what's behind all this? What's the meaning of all this? What's the meaning of what we're doing? Okay, what's the ultimate purpose of what we're doing? If pressed, the, this, 
average man, so to speak, will affirm his faith, which is based on two propositions. All truth is empirical, all truth is relative. Those, those are the two pillars of modern, the modern belief, right? All truth is empirical, that is based on sense data, and all truth is relative. But both of these statements, Father Seraphim points out, both these statements are self-contradictory. They're inherently contradictory. For the first statement, all truth is empirical, is a metaphysical assumption. It's a non-empirical assertion. It can't be proved empirically. It's an assumption about how knowledge functions. It's metaphysical. Okay. And the second statement, all truth is relative, is an absolute claim. Hmm. <laughs> so well, you say, well, all truth is relative. I don't believe you. Why? Well, because what you just said is relative. <laughs> I choose not to believe it. That sounds good. It sounds good. <laughs> all right. So the critical observer is led inevitably by such inherent contradictions to the conclusion that if there is such a thing as truth, it cannot be merely relative. There must be first, there must be first principles prior to and not subject to scientific investigation. That seems that once we say it, it's obvious, right? But, but people who believe in relativism and empiricism don't, don't realize this. Right? I want to reproduce in full two extremely important, important statements by the author. The, the, the is directly quoting from the end of paragraph 15 and all of paragraph 16. The first principles, these are Father Seraphim's words from the book, the first principles of modern science, as of any system of knowledge, are themselves unchangeable and absolute. If they were not, there would be no knowledge at all, not even the most reflective knowledge. There would be no criteria by which to classify anything as knowledge or truth. Right? So there have to be pre-existing criteria for classifying things as knowledge or truth. Next paragraph. This axiom has a corollary. The absolute cannot be attained by means of the relative. It's logic. <laughs> The absolute cannot be attained by means of the relative. That is to say, the first principles of any system of knowledge cannot be arrived at through the means of that knowledge itself. You can't lift yourself up by your bootstraps and arrive at ultimate truth starting on a foundation of relativism. Okay? First principles have to be given in advance. They are the object, not so, they are the object not of scientific demonstration, but of faith. Faith. There has to be faith. Faith in something. You start off with faith in something. In paragraph 17, the author goes on to explain this leads to the necessity of faith as the foundation of all knowledge. Everyone has assumptions. Everyone has to believe in some basis of knowledge before he can claim that he has knowledge. Basic assumptions that make science possible must be taken on faith. For example, and these are Father Seraphim's words, for example, the coherence and uniformity of nature, that nature is a coherent whole and that and the uniformity of natural processes, wherever they happen in the observable cosmos. Right? That's an assumption. The trans-subjectivity of human knowledge, that means I can, you and I can know the same things. Without that, there's no science. That's why we, we said much earlier, and Weaver points out, that nominalism makes, actually makes science impossible, real science impossible. The adequacy of reason to draw conclusions from observation that our mind, we assume that our mind can draw conclusions from observation. Of course, philosophically, Hume destroys that. <laughs> so if you believe in Hume or anything, any, or the whole school of skepticism following Hume, including Kantian philosophy, you, really, you, only, you only accept the adequacy of reason to draw conclusions on, for pragmatic reasons, just to go on with your job, but you don't really believe in it. See? But if science is true, then there must be, reason must be adequate to draw conclusions from observation. But these are assumptions from they're from a the from a theological and philosophical viewpoint they can't be demonstrated by empirical methods these are givens based on a philosophy of nature a philosophy of man on a metaphysics you cannot prove them empirically because empirical method presupposes them okay. for science to work these things have to already be in place they have to be true materialistic scientists and humanists like to ignore such questions and just deal with pragmatic concerns but this does not rescue science from an inadequate basis on which to defend itself from the attacks of a destructive irrationalism. In the 19th century, we have the apex of man's pride in claiming that he can make, have infinite progress based on science. At the same time, the nihilists say, ah, we're going to destroy everything. And it led to this orgy of destruction of the 20th century, World War I, revolutions, World War II, and so forth. In real life, of course, they do act, the scientists, the material, I don't mean all scientists, of course there are scientists who are good philosophers, who are Christians, who do understand these things, uh, but they're, I'm talking about the materialistic, or I don't mean materialistic in the sense they want to have a Porsche or have a, 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 a beach house and 
in Monte Carlo or something. I'm, they're materialistic in the sense of philosophically materialistic. Okay? In real life, these philosophically materialistic scientists and humanists do act as if their project is based on some kind of truth. They do have a religion. They act as if it has truth. They really do have a kind of primitive faith, a metaphysical position, but they don't admit they have a metaphysical position. Well, their metaphysical position is crude and it's, not, it's indefensible. Every man lives by faith in something. Everyone is a phys metaphysician. The, these are Father Seraphim's uh, assertions here. Every man is a metaphysician whether he knows it or not. That is, he has assumptions about the first principles of reality and of life. He may not, he, he, most people are unconscious of their assumption, but they have these assumptions. They have metaphysical assumptions about the nature of things, things that cannot be proved, that must precede conclusions about how one should live. This is in paragraphs 18 and 19 of the book, of section 1. And paragraph 19 is, is really important, and I'm going to re reproduce it here in full. Okay. Every man, as we have seen, lives by faith. Likewise, every man, something less obvious but no less certain, is a metaphysician. The claim to any knowledge whatever, and no living man can refrain from this claim, claiming some kind of knowledge of something, implies a theory and standard of knowledge, and a notion of what is ultimately knowable and true. The ultimate, this ultimate truth, whether it be conceived as a Christian God, or simply the ultimate coherence of things, is a metaphysical first principle. It's an absolute truth. But with the acknowledgement logically unavoidable of such a principle, the theory of relativity, relativity of truth collapses, it, it itself being revealed as a self-contradictory absolute. Right? That all things are relative is an absolute statement. It's a metaphysical assumption. Okay? So the philosophy of a relativity of truth is then, it's despite, its, despite itself, it's a metaphysics. It's a metaphysical position. What one might call, using Father Seraphim's term, he calls it in the book, he calls it a negative metaphysics, kind of an anti-metaphysics. The author divides the types of this negative metaphysics into the realistic and agnostic, each of which has two subtypes, the naive and the critical. So realistic, those people say we can know, we do know these things. The agnostic is saying I can't know, from a, ah, the Greek privative, right, a, ah, not, gnosis, knowledge. <clears throat> So there, so I call, I divided this part, uh, or I, I label this part, the four schools of negative metaphysics. That's paragraphs 21 to 25. The first, so there are two kinds of realism and two kinds of agnosticism. In paragraphs 21 and 22, the author talks about naive realism. Realism is the idea that we can really know things that are real. <laughs> we can really know things that are real. Agnosticism is the idea we cannot know real things. Naive realism is the same as, is, is the position of what we called, earlier I called scientism, right? Everything that exists is material. Everything that happens is determined by material processes, which we can study and really, really know, and then use our knowledge to create a better world, a bright future. Hey, this is the essence of Marxism, any kind of progressivism, right? This is the crude worldview of all progressivism, including Marxism, the various forms of scientific socialism, and also progressive Christianity. In the 19th century, we have the explosion of progressive Christianity, of people who are bishops, priests, missionaries, and so forth. But they're not concerned with the otherworldly aspect of the gospel, with eternal life or sin. They're concerned with making the world a better place. The Victorian British call this muscular Christianity. We're going to go to the, it's the white man's burden. We're going to go to Africa and India and build hospitals and make the world a better place in the name of Christ. So they, they put the name of Christ on the, outside, right? But on the inside, it's just more materialism. It's, it's a pure humanistic approach. You know, and the same people who are, who are taking this view to so-called missionary work are the ones whose their, their cousins and their mentors in the seminaries are debunking the gospel, right? Debunking the Old Testament, right? Claiming that Christ never said all these things and that the miracles didn't occur and so forth and so on, okay? Creating a purely worldly Christianity, progressive Christianity. So there are the, and so uh, what we have, of course, today, these are the denominations that are all dying, Methodists, mainstream, mainline Methodists, mainline Church of England, and so forth. These, at least, it, it's all dying. Why go to a church? If that's, <laughs> if that's what it is, I don't need to go to church to do that, right? In the 19th century, they thought they were being very smart and that they were being good Christians, right, by forgetting about all those miracles and asceticism and fasting and saints and just focusing on making the world a better place. But if they are so Bible, mm -hmm. in the New Testament, in the four Gospels, there are multiple yes. episodes when Jesus Christ fought against demons. Or, yes. Or, I mean, how, how can they explain that? I mean, they, that happened and that's it? We'll have, to have a, we'll, we'll have to have a whole, we could have a whole class on modern so-called higher criticism. In the 19th century, Protestant 
divinity professors created a whole school called the higher criticism where they use methods of literary criticism to say that many, many things in the gospel did not happen. And, to, and uh, they claim they could prove it through literary analysis. And, uh, but really what they're doing, they, were already, they already had the assumptions of these philosophical schools. They already assumed that uh, the material is all that exists, but they still didn't want to give up their identity as Christians or their jobs um, or just what they would call Christian culture. A lot of these people really believed in Christian culture. They believed that if I go to China and I build a hospital and I make the little children uh, wear coats and ties instead of Chinese robes, I'm bringing them something superior in the name of Christ, you see. So it was a, a secular, a, 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 a progr it's, uh, the word for it is progressivism. It's called progressive Christianity. It's a, yes, it's, it's a very low. <coughs> yes, it is. It is of a very low order, <coughs> spiritually and intellectually. But these are highly intelligent people who, who said really stupid things. For example, uh, these men, one of, one of the, the, the greatest of these men, um, Harnack, is the editor-in-chief of our most complete English series of the Holy Fathers, the Eerdmann series. <laughs> and all the men who translated these things are highly, I mean, highly intelligent men. They knew their Latin and Greek backwards and forwards. They'd read all the fathers. And uh, they liked it, they admired it, but they couldn't understand how these men could believe in miracles and fasting and asceticism. And uh, I, I'll never forget when I first read the translation of the life of St. Martin of Tours by Sulpicius Severus. Who's a, Sulpicius Severus is a very erudite man, a product of the classical culture and so forth. And the, the translator obviously admires St. Martin, he obviously admires Sulpicius Severus, but he says, he says um, it's hard to understand how, how the author could have credulously accepted all these miracle stories. So it's like, we, we, want to, we want to admire St. Martin, but we don't believe he worked any miracles. See, because they were convinced that to be enlightened meant to, be, to, to deny the supernatural. But the purpose of Christianity was to make the world a better place. St. Martin was a saint because he fed the poor and because he um, spread, he preserved uh, the old culture by, by creating monasteries and so forth. But all these miracles and all that, that's... You know, modern that we've grown, we've grown beyond that. Temptation of serpent Eve. Yeah, you shall be God. Yeah. So all these, I got into progressive, so-called progressive Christianity because it's a form of this naive realism. This is the bait that is still used today to lure the masses into compliance with social engineering schemes. Okay, they're every, they're always coming up with new schemes to re-engineer everybody. Promise. They're promising the bright future, right? If only we, if only you cooperate with this, we'll get rid of some kind of oppression or. Uh, discrimination or poverty or something like that. So its adherents claim to love humanity and do good. Okay, so they're, they're, the, the more naive ones, the ones that are really are naive are idealistic, even though they don't believe in ideals because they, they, supposedly they're materialists, right? But the absurdity of basing loving humanity on materialistic determinism is demonstrated by Vladimir Solovyev's satirical summation of Darwinist humanism. Quote, this is a great, <laughs> a great line from Solovyev. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not Neither Father Seraphim nor I are promoting Solofiev. Solofiev has problems, but he has some great insights. And uh, here's a great line from Solofiev. Man is descended from monkey, and consequently, we shall love one another. <laughs> I mean, that's, the, that's, the <laughs> that's the syllogism of, of uh, progressive Christianity, right? <laughs> Thus, it's, it's idiotic, right? It's supposed idealism based on materialism, right? It doesn't make any sense. So that, that, that doesn't go very far. And there's critical realism which also known as logical positivism, or the Vienna School. Critical realism points out that the moral claims of progressivism and scientism are themselves ideals. They're honest. They're more consistent. Wait, these are ideals. We, we have to, if we're really uh, realists and we're, really, and we're materialists, we're going to sweep that away. No ideals. You can know things, but all you can know is what you can prove empirically. You cannot know things like the good of mankind and so forth. So they don't believe in all this progressivism. Of course, this has not solved the problem of empirical science being based on metaphysical assumptions. Also, if you really are a po logical positivist, you really have no reason to go on. That's why probably all those people in Vienna were going to uh, Freud to get psychoanalyzed. Um, <clears throat> Darwin himself uh, realized the implications of his theories. Later in life, he, I, I believe it was in a letter to his daughter, he wrote that he was, de now, now that he really believed in these things that he taught, he was depressed all the time because he no longer had any interest in music, art, literature, religion, because he, his theories make all those things meaningless, of no purpose. So the rest, the rest of his life, he was, once he really 
accepted all of his own teachings and saw the implications of it, he was just depressed. Just depressed. See, uh, but he was a you might say he was a critical realist. Now there are two kinds of agnosticism. There's absolute agnosticism, naive agnosticism, that says that one absolutely cannot know anything. Well, then of course the question is, well, how do you know that? How do you know you can't know anything? Of course, this this is itself an absolute assertion, so it's self-contradictory. Agnosticism is the um, is another cop out. You know, there's relative agnosticism. Well, we can't know. Well, we can't know. We can't know anything. There's but there's a more intelligent or critical agnosticism, and their position is that we cannot know that we cannot know. They say, well, wait a second, that's an absolute statement. So maybe there is an absolute truth, but if there is, we can't know it. And we should just devote ourselves to pragmatic concerns. Just deal with Basically, but, but of course, from the Christian point of view, what they're saying is just devote yourself to your passions, okay? to satisfying your passions, or the passions of others. Satisfying. Why one should devote oneself to anything or do anything or not commit suicide, they can't explain. But this is the logical end of the whole process, starting with naive, naive realism, and it is nakedly immoral and re- irresponsible. Just go for it. Just do whatever you want, because we can't know. If there is an absolute truth, we can't know it. Just, be, just live day to day and just do your thing. Of course, there are... To give some agnostics some credit, there are agnostics, theological agnostics, who hold to some high standard of behavior based on what they view as personal integrity. Um, pe- some people take a stoical outlook. I'm just doing the right thing even though there's no God, or if there is, I can't know it. I'm just going to do the right thing. Well, I know it's the right thing. Well, I just know it's the right thing, and I want to I do it. There are people like that. But they're easy to yeah. Goal. Some goal or some ideal. Yeah. Come yeah, well, very well, communism produced very uh, and, and large numbers of very self-sacrificing people. So the paragraphs twenty-six to twenty-nine I have uh, titled "The End of the Search for Truth Outside Revelation." So, since the going back, going back now to our whole journey since the Middle Ages, right, starting with that um, turn towards denying revelation as the basis of truth, which we clearly see with Descartes, right. There's a whole project from Descartes on. There's a whole project of seeking for truth, just using the human mind, with no help from the outside. Right? But it, it, the, it, but the, it ends up with this position of nihilism. See, it's the end of the line. At the end of this entire project of Western man, trying to find a basis for knowledge and action outside of the Christian revelation, we have then arrived at two options. <clears throat> Ignore the search for truth altogether and content oneself with pragmatic and conventional life. Okay? So just forget about truth. And just focus on pragmatic concerns. You know, let's build a let's build a better bridge. Let's let's uh, grow taste to your food. Whatever, just just because, because ultimately because it satisfies the passion. Or people can go on searching for truth, but they've rejected the Christian revelation, so they search for truth in irrational revelations, visions, authoritarian cults, pseudo mysticism, UFOs, uh, aliens, science fiction, and so forth. Okay, because we see around us as we see people simultaneously. The same people will say that Christianity is naive and, and uh, a bunch of myths and how can you believe all that stuff? And they'll turn right around and believe some book about UFOs or, or um, you know, messages being received from aliens or things like that. So they're, they're still searching for truth. They search, they're searching for it in these false revelations. Everybody's looking, just as everyone has assumptions, everyone deep down is looking for a revelation, a revelation of what's real, what's true, or what's going to, live, what's going to give their life meaning. Uh, give them a feeling of or, or experience of transcendence. Revelation. Of course, it's all from demons. That's right. And, yes, yes. It, it's if it's not from Christ, if it's not truth, then it's from somewhere else. Right. Father Seraphim concludes this section thus: In fact, no one lives but by the light of some revelation. Remember Descartes. Remember going back to Descartes, the father of this whole project. He says we must put aside all tradition, put aside all revelation. Put aside anything prior and just start with the mind. Cogito ergo sum, I believe, therefore I am. But remember, when you read his biography, he was inspired for this project by three dreams that he had. <laughs> he had dreams where spirits were telling him to do this. So, <laughs> maybe. maybe he got some instructions, yes. So, um, so everybody's, everybody actually lives by some kind of revelation, though they don't admit it. Be it a true or false revelation, whether it served to enlighten or to obscure, he who will not live by the Christian revelation will, will live, must live, by a false revelation. All false revelations lead to the abyss. Everybody has a religion, whether they know it or not. There's one true one, and the others lead to the abyss. Okay. G, paragraphs 30 to 32. The solution to the problem is Christ. The only answer to all of this is, of course, he who made the radical claim that he is the truth. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. Christ is the logos, the blueprint, the meaning of all created reality. Therefore, all true philosophy, all investigation of truth must begin with him. Proud man does not want to seek this answer outside of his own brain power. He wants to find the truth for himself. Well, I don't want to be a weakling and just run to the Bible or somewhere. I'm going to find out the truth for myself. Okay. Man does not want the narrow way of humbling his mind or body, fighting intellectual and spiritual pride, fighting his spiritual and physical passions. But he cannot really oppose Christ with logic or science. Ultimately, what is opposed to Christ is another demonic revelation. And this revelation is the essence of nihilism. Nihilism is really a product of a demonic revelation. The, the conclusion of this, of this introduction, Father Seraphim says, though we will examine various kinds of nihilists, there are different schools of nihilists, right? But they all have the same aim, the annihilation of divine revelation. They want to wipe out of men's minds the very memory of Christ, of the true faith, and so forth and preparation of a new order. Now, he's writing this in 1960, so the term New World Order wasn't really as common as it is now, right? but he was already seeing it. It was easy. In 1960, it was already, already easy to see it. The preparation of a new order in which man will be God, or at least the demons will tell man he's going to be God. You will be like, you will be like God's, yes. Mm -hmm. 